Well, it's, it's great to be with you all. And, you know, thanks, obviously, for inviting me to be with you today. Um, and, and many thanks to, to you, Dave, for, for the class, but also for the work you're doing to advance God's reign of justice in this world. Um, as, as you introduced, my name is Reverend Dr. Liz Theo Harris. I'm a pastor um, of the Freedom Church of the Poor, an activist uh, leading both the Cairo Center here at Union and the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. I'm a mother uh, of public school kids that live here in New York City. And I'm also a biblical scholar and theologian that has been connected, as you said in my introduction, to Union Theological Seminary for, for about 20 years now. Um, it was actually my first systematic theology class um, session with Professor James Cohn was on 9-11. Um, and this institution and the time that we're living in have shaped uh, my worldview, shaped my theology, as well as my kind of practice moral action out in the world. So indeed, this morning, I, I do want to talk with you all about the Poor People's Campaign, the Cairo Center, this moral movement to fully address systemic racism and poverty, ecological devastation, militarism and the war economy, and the distorted moral narrative of narrative of, of Christian nationalism. And uh, to do that, I, I want to go back uh, a little bit. Um, since I began to organize as a part of a movement um, of poor people, um, and that's been close to 30 years ago, people have said to me uh, that our goals are too ambitious, that demands for human rights and human dignity are, are politically inconceivable and impossibly expensive. Folks quote the Bible, um, arguing that since Jesus said the poor will be with you always, it, it can't possibly be God's will for everyone to share in the abundance of our world. But when I read the Bible, when I engage out in the community, uh, what I see in the Bible from Genesis throughout the New Testament and our communities across the world and country is a constant revelation uh, of God's will that no one should be made hungry or sick or homeless or underpaid or indebted or bereft by the violence of, of social injustice. I read really an ongoing indictment of those who would take and keep the wealth of our world for themselves and cause others to suffer. Um, and, and it's from this place that I come to, to much of the work that we're doing at the Cairo Center and in the Poor People's Campaign, um, with the assertion, for instance, that ending poverty is possible. Um, and, and I think it's really important for us to actually spend a little time, especially in a class that's focused on faith and kind of public action in the world, to, to see that there are strong biblical and theological foundations for doing anti-poverty, anti-racist work. Um, and in fact, even uh, uh, the kind of passage that has been weaponized against uh, me and anyone challenging the inevitability of poverty and scarcity, this line from the Bible where Jesus says, the poor will be with you always, um, is actually referencing uh, a reminder from the prophetic and sacred Hebrew scriptures that that poverty indeed um, must be ended um, if we're to actually live into God's promise and possibility in the world. And so, um, I think I want to I want to start a little bit with a, a favorite quote of of Dr. King's, um, where he puts out this idea that a true revolution of values will soon cause us to question the fairness and justice of many of our past and present policies. On the one hand, we're called to play the Good Samaritan on life's roadside, but that will only be an initial act. One day, we must come to see that the whole Jericho Road must be transformed so that men and women will not constantly be beaten and robbed as they make their journey on life's highway. True compassion is more than flinging a coin to a beggar. It comes to see that an edifice which produces beggars needs restructuring. And so I want us to think a little bit about 
about this charge from Dr. King, which I actually would assert uh, is most likely Dr. King's reinterpretation of the kind of inevitability of poverty and that the only solution to poverty is is charity um, and band-aids. Um, uh, and, and I'd like us to think about this um, in the context of both the, the larger kind of theological and biblical message, as well as, as what it means um, in our world today. And, and in our world today, we live in a nation where there are 140 million people who are poor or who are one fire, one healthcare crisis, one job loss or storm, or, or some small emergency from deep poverty. We live in a nation where 26 million people reported not having enough food to eat last year in the same nation that throws out 72 billion pounds of food. Um, uh, our nation spends 53 cents of every discretionary dollar on the military and less than 15 cents on healthcare and education and anti-poverty programs combined. And in this pandemic and with the economic crisis that is uh, connected to it, we're on the verge of a homelessness and eviction crisis unseen in the nation before with tens of millions of people at risk of eviction. But what we know about this is that in truth, these are exactly the times when prophets arise to remind us of God's demand for justice and God's judgment of those whose power and wealth rests on the dispossession of the rest of society. You know, Jesus's ministry began at a time much like ours when the Roman Empire was strangling millions of poor people and still calling it peace. And he begins, as we all know, by declaring directly draw, drawing from the prophet Isaiah, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to preach good news, evangelism to the Patokos, those made poor by policy and justice. And so, uh, yet we live in 2021 and in Lowndes County, Alabama, families have raw sewage in their yards and mold in their homes and children have to use CPAP machines just to breathe. In Oak Flat, Arizona, native grave sites are being desecrated and indigenous families are being pushed out. In Grace Harbor, Washington State, homeless encampments of predominantly white and native millennials are being attacked by police and, and militia groups. And, and in Flint, Michigan, uh, and in four million homes across the US, uh, moms can buy unleaded gas and unleaded paint, but still this many years later, are not able to provide unleaded water for their children. So in the, in the context of that, both the biblical and theological context, but then also the kind of very real context of poverty and racism and oppression in our world and our society today, I want us to talk a little bit about a movement that's building to change all of these problems. Um, a movement that, 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 and a campaign that, that, that declares that poverty is not designed divine necessity, but instead a human creation. Uh, and that um, the only uh, scarcity we have in our country and in our world is a scarcity of political will to actually uh, end um, poverty and racism and injustice um, in, in our lives um, and for everyone. Uh, so the Poor People's Campaign was founded uh, about four years ago. Um, in the lead up and then since then, we've been traveling across the United States and then in the last 18 plus months of this pandemic, we've been gathering with people sometimes socially distanced in person and a lot of times in Zoom and Zoom rooms and other forms of social media. But what we've seen from the Bronx to the border, from Appalachia to Aberdeen, from the deep south to the California coast, is that people are coming together and they're demanding justice. So the Poor People's Campaign launched in the spring of 2018 with the largest and most expansive wave of nonviolent civil disobedience in the 21st century. And in many ways, historians have told us in, in US history, um, people from all races, all genders, all religions, all walks of life, poor and low wage workers, advocates, clergy, surge state capitals in 40 states and the US Capitol in Washington, DC. And we all call the tension to, to a fusion movement, a moral 
movement um, that's taking up what we call the real moral issues of our day. And that's healthcare, that's housing, that's living wages, that's voting rights, that's immigrant rights, that's LGBTQ rights. Um, since 2018, we have built coordinating committees that are made up of impacted people, clergy, activists, advocates in nearly every state in the country. We're able to engage thousands of volunteer leaders, um, thousands of clergy, and more than 300,000 folks that are kind of quote unquote members um, of the campaign, as well as 200 partner organizations, some of the biggest labor unions, the faith denominations and grassroots organizations um, in, in the country. Uh, our, our reach is, is at least 50 million people. Um, and, uh, and, and what we're seeing in this campaign is that people are, are coming together and organizing themselves in, in very new and exciting ways. Um, you know, across the country, poor and low income people, religious leaders, people of conscience are kind of breaking through these stubborn silos um, uh, and forging kind of these powerful, these new alliances um, in their local communities, in their states, and then nationalizing those state-based movements into a national movement. So that's both kind of the daily work of various place, local specific, state specific organizing, as well as kind of fielding nationally coordinated activities, um, things like the Poor People's Moral Action Congress that we held in 2019, poverty bus tours and hundreds of communities, revival mass meetings and in dozens of, of, of cities and, and the largest digital gathering um, of poor and low-income people in US history, where more than 2 million people gathered um, to kind of hear not just the sad stories of, of what people are going through, but the powerful agenda and, and power and organizing that, that poor and low-income people are doing to, to kind of build a movement. We, we presented and present pretty regularly um, to different congressional hearings and, and and marched into the House Budget Committee um, not so long ago with a, a, our own Poor People's Moral Budget um, and have and been putting out, you know, we, we say in our work that we're not just cursing the darkness, but we're, we're shining a light on, on an agenda uh, that is possible um, and that is actually far less costly than it is to have the levels of, of racism and poverty and ecological devastation and, and um, and just misery um, that exists in our society today. You know, in the 2020 election and in the run up to it, um, the Poor People's Campaign mobilized our, our kind of infrastructure into a very expansive voter registration and protection campaign. Um, we texted and called over 2.3 million uh, low income, uh, low propensity voters. Um, we developed a poll monitoring and legal defense strategy in dozens of states, um, and we were able to reach, you know, really millions with um, various kind of training and educational programming. Uh, we, we held a, a gathering in the lead up to the election where President, you know, where, where now President Joe Biden spoke to, to more than 1 million, 1.7 million people and promised that his administration will make ending poverty not just an aspiration, but a theory of change. And then he affirmed this promise at a mass poor people and low wage workers assembly uh, that we held this past June. Um, since July, the Poor People's Campaign has been organizing a season of moral direct action, trying to connect especially the issues of voting rights and immigrant rights and living wages and economic justice with the kind of investments, <clears throat> excuse me, an infrastructure of our roads and buildings, but also in our democracy and in our, our the lives of the people and our budgets. And so we're, you know, kind of continue to leverage our power to advocate for substantial um, public investment in policies that permanently protect foreign impacted communities that include, you know, bold and visionary housing and healthcare and food and utilities and guaranteed income policies and, and so much more. Um, so we believe that to address poverty, we must simultaneously address these five issues, systemic racism, systemic poverty, uh, ecological devastation, the war economy, and uh, this distorted moral narrative of religious nationalism, a narrative that kind of blames poor people and immigrants and queer people for all of society's problems, 
a narrative that pits us against each other and that sells us this lie that this is as good as it gets. Um, so we believe that we must have a sustained moral movement that engages in a broad fusion of people from every walk of life, um, a movement that engages the nation with moral analysis, moral articulation, and moral action. Um, if we have a different moral imagination, we can have policy shifts guided by this kind of fusion, and we can choose uh, a, a better way of, of organizing ourselves. We believe we have to say that if those who want to suppress our votes and our wages and cut education and block healthcare and define who we can love and increase gun rights and deregulate industry and attack immigrants and women, if they are cynical enough, if they're mean enough to be together, then our fusion movement has to be hopeful enough, it has to be smart enough to, to get together and keep on organizing together. And, and by looking throughout US history, whenever this country has faced forces of regression, moral movements have arisen to call us to higher ground. It's what the abolitionists did in the 19th century and the women suffragists did in the earliest 20th century. It's what happens when Rosa Parks and Dr. King and many other grassroots moral leaders of every race and creed and color and sexuality did when they built the civil rights movement. And it's what Dr. King and Marion Wright Edelman and the welfare rights movement and others called us into the poor people's campaign uh, more than 50 years ago, um, challenging the nation to see these different connections between racism and poverty and militarism uh, before Dr. King was was murdered. Um, so so it's in that context, again, that that we're building up a moral movement that has the power um, to be able to really transform the nation um, and that sees poor and low income people as moral and political agents of change, uh, not as recipients of, of charity or pity um, or punishment. And so, uh, you know, I think it's it's in that context um, that that you know, we do our work and that we're kind of reaching out to as many people as we can connect with um, and, and saying we're, we're building a movement. It's a movement led by the people. We're coming together. We're organizing together, reuniting together. We're addressing these issues that we see as being very connected. Um, and we're choosing life and truth and justice and peace. Um, and that this movement indeed needs and needs everyone. Um, and so I, I, I look forward to us, you know, talking more and, and having uh, some of a discussion and a dialogue. Um, and I and I welcome people to 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 look at the poorpeoplescampaign.org and to look at the anchor organizations of that campaign, uh, the Cairo Center that I direct and repairs of the breach that is led by Reverend Dr. William Barber. Um, because, uh, you know, I think in in the vision that we have and in, in mostly a movement that is being led by those that are most directly impacted um, by these injustices, we see the, the chance to kind of save the, the heart and the soul of our democracy and of our, of our, of our world. Um, uh, this, this idea, a very biblical, very theological idea that, that the, the, the stone that the builders rejected um, must become the the cornerstone of of uh, of a of a new a new life and a new way of being, and that um, that indeed it's it's those that have been rejected rejected by um, by the status quo and by society who are then you know leading a revival of our deepest um, moral and constitutional values. Um, so. So uh, again, it's it's great to be with you all, and I, I look forward to us having a chance to be in more conversation together.